So here are the solutions to exercise two. We start with question one in time series analysis. We have a particular process here. We're being given these parameters, so we don't have to estimate them. We are given them, and uh, so that will become important. And we have the last few observations. Uh, let's say um, so. Set T minus 1 is 0.9 and set t minus 2 is 1.1. So the question is would you expect the time series to increase, decrease or remain constant? This now depends on the unconditional mean of set t because we know that in a stationary process as this guy is because that is smaller than 1, our forecasts are going to move towards this unconditional expectation. So we need to know what the unconditional expectation is relative to our last value of 0.9. We know for an AR1 process the unconditional expectation is the constant divided by 1 minus the AR1 parameter 0.8 and that in this case equals 1. Our last observation is 0.9 so we expect set t to increase from the last observation. Well, graphically, let's do this. We have set t, we have times t minus 2, t minus 1, our values are here 1.1 then we are have here 0.9 and our unconditional expectation is this value exactly 1 so what we expect is that our series for future periods t t plus 1 is going to convert to this unconditional mean Okay, so that's question one. The uh, second part of the question is that we actually should calculate conditional expectations. We know our last few values, so we should be calculating the expected value of set t plus i for these i. So the first one we need is yeah, and so we are basically now calculating the values here on that green line. Okay, t plus 2 and the last is going to be t plus 3. These values we are now going to calculate. So the first one is set t, t plus i for i equals 0, conditional on the information at time t minus 1. Now, information at time t minus 1 that contains all the past values up to time t minus 1. So that these values we know. So the conditional expectation we just need to use our process here. So for t it's going to be 0.2 uh, sorry so it's going to be the expected value conditional on i t minus 1. So, expected value of what? Of set t. Now, our process for set t is 0.2 plus 0.8 times set t minus 1 plus ut. So, we can deconstruct that into the uh, uh, sum of the expectations, the expectation of 0.2 given it minus 1 is just 0.2, that's just a constant parameter, plus expected value of 0.8 times z t minus 1 given it minus 1, I'll leave that here for the moment, plus the expected value of ut given i t minus 1. Just squeeze that in here. 
So here we have 0.2 plus, we can get the factor 0.8 out. And what we get is the expected value of set t minus 1, conditional on i t minus 1. Now in i t minus 1, we actually have the value y t minus 1. Uh, sorry, in, instead of y's, we are talking about sets here, of course. Okay, so we have the value of set t minus 1, that is this guy here, 0 0.9. So it's going to be 0 0.8 times 0 0.9 plus this guy, expected value of ut, given information we have one period before, well that's just going to be 0. So here we have 0.92. The next step, expected value of set t plus 1. So this value here is 0 0.92. Given it minus 1, again, we'll do mechanistically, we'll just write out our expectation. Instead of set t plus 1, we'll put in our process, but now written for set t plus 1. So that's 0 0.2 plus 0 0.8. One period bef before we'll set t plus 1 is going to be set t plus ut plus 1. And again, mass is the constant, plus 0.8 times the expected value of set t given i t minus 1, plus the expected value of u t plus 1 given i t minus 1. So we have 0.2 plus 0.8 and now what we need to do is we need to recognize that this guy we don't have okay the value of set t given i t minus 1 set t is not in our information set but this guy we just calculated and the result of which was 0.92 so it's 0.8 times 0.92 plus this one here again that is zero and then we have as a result 0.936 and we can continue like this set t plus 2 given i t minus 1 and now I'll do a little shortcut because we can see the pattern here going to get 0 0.2 plus 0 0.8 times the expected value of set t plus 1, that was the predecessor value, given information at time t minus 1. And then we we'll get the last bit again, expected value of ut plus 2 given i t minus 1, but this is going to be 0 again. So now the task is to get this value, and that is of course exactly what we calculated in the step before, 0.936. So once we substitute in 0.936, what we do get as a result is 0.9488. And then lastly, the last one we are supposed to calculate is set t plus 3 given i t minus information at t minus 1 and we get 0 0.2 plus 0 0.8 times expected value of set t plus 2 given information at t minus 1 and again we're going to have the error term u t plus 3 given information at t minus 1 that's going to be 0 and now we need to recognize that this guy is of course exactly what we calculated the step before, so it's 0 0.9488. And if we sub that into the calculation, what we get is 0 0.95904. So if you now look at these values, we go from our current value of 0 0.9. We expect 0 0.92, 0 0.936, 0 0.9488, 0 0.9504. So we are slowly approaching 
a value of 1. But you can see it's quite slow. We are starting out with a difference between 0.9 and 1. So there's 0.1 units difference and after 1, 2, 3, 4 x four steps forward we expect that we have basically made up half of that distance we are now at 0.96 a bit more than half okay. after three steps we are at about half after three steps we expect to have half that difference eaten away and it will take longer and longer to go all the way up so let's go on to part 3 of the question explain the meaning of weakly dependent data in general is the process described above weakly dependent so what we said for weakly dependent the definition was that the correlation between set T and set t, let's say, minus j, goes towards zero as j increases, okay, as, as the, as the uh, time lag between our two observations goes, um, becomes larger and larger, we want that uh, eventually the values are uncorrelated. Now here we have an AR1 process and if we let's use an abbreviation here rho j and j indicates the lag and for an AR1 process we know that rho j is going to be equal to the AR1 parameter and that is up here our 0.8 that these correlations are related to that parameter 0.8 and in particular the formula we have is that rho j equals 0.8 to the power of j so the question is now as j becomes larger does this guy go to zero let's just do a couple of values let's calculate uh, row 1, that is just going to be 0.8 row 2, that's going to be 0.64 let's calculate row 5 that is going to be 0.8 to the power of 5 let me just use a calculator here 0.8 to the power of 5 so what we get is 0.328 that is 0.3 328. Let's also calculate row 10. So 0.8 to the power of 10. 0.8 to the power of 10. And we get 0.107 approximately. 0.107. So you can see we're having a, a really quite significant decline of the correlation. Yeah, after 10 periods, the correlation ha has dropped from 0.8 to 0.107. If you were to draw the correlogram here, so here we have our row j's, here we have our j's. At 1, we started at 0.8. At 10, we have come down to 0.1. 1 here so what we see that correlation declining quite significantly so what we said in fact as this guy here as 0.8 is smaller than 1 indeed we have a weekly stationary process uh, sorry a weekly dependent or a stationary process okay now and what did we say did that, did that mean we had such a process? That implied that when we forecast, and then we go to the second part, going back to the uh, answers in part one and two, that meant that when we forecast, our process will converge to the unconditional mean. That means if we just go far enough into the future, okay, if we go very far over here, 
it really doesn't matter where you started out because if you had started up here then the process would have converged this way and would have converged to the unconditional mean so if you just go far enough ahead it doesn't really matter where here you start you always end up at the unconditional mean that means that has to mean that the correlation between these values far enough in the future and this value here has to converge to zero because otherwise it wouldn't otherwise it would have to matter where you are So let's move on to the next question. So in the Excel spreadsheet they are processes XLS, we find three series. So let's let's go straight uh, straight there. Um, here we have I've loaded the uh, the spreadsheet and we can see three time series. And they have, let's see how many observations they have. They have 300 observations, each of them. And let's call them X, Y, and Z. And the task is now that we want to estimate AR1 processes for each of them. And then we're going to ask if, you know, um, would you use these? So, uh, comment on the parameter estimates and on the weak dependence properties of the series. Would you use any of these as explanatory variables in a regression? So, let's call up eViews and we'll create a new work file. And we have um, 300 observations. data into the views what did we say they are called x y and z I think x y and z yeah. so um, series 1 is x series 2 is y and series 3 is z so we asked to calculate an um, AR1 process. So let me first open an equation. It's easiest if you highlight two series to open an equation. Um, but we want just for we just want to estimate a process for x. So what we want, let me briefly illustrate that here. What we want to estimate is a, a model like this, x t equals alpha naught plus alpha 1 xt minus 1 plus an error term. So we have a dependent variable x, a constant as explanatory variable, and as another explanatory variable we have xt minus 1, the lag version of x. So how do we do this? In eviews we have x as a dependent, a constant, and x and then in parenthesis negative 1 for a 1 period lag and all we've got to do is we press OK. What we get is this uh, coefficient constant 0 0.0659 and uh, the AR1 coefficient negative 0 0.036 let me just um, copy that across here So we get xt hat, so our regression line is 0.069 approximately plus, no sorry, not plus, but minus 0.0369. Xt minus 1. So this coefficient here is pretty small. It is certainly smaller than 1. That means we already know that what we have here is a, you know, most likely a stationary process. 
let's actually look at the process and see whether this uh, whether what we see from the data corresponds to this intuition. So let's just look at X, look at the graph, the line graph, and what we can see is something that looks just extremely random. Okay, it looks extremely random. If we look at this coefficient, if we were to test the hypothesis that this guy is equal to zero, we wouldn't be able to reject that. So there seems to be no dependence in the data whatsoever. So that was the first process. Now we'll go to estimate. Now let's do this for the uh, y process. So we'll just replace the x with y and we run this again. What you now get is a really quite uh, a, a much larger coefficient, 0.624 approximately, and we can see this seems to be quite clearly different from zero. The t test rejects this quite clearly. So um, go back here, so for y, let me use a different color. So yt had our predicted model, our estimated model is 0.392 plus 0.623 times y t minus t minus 1. Now this guy again seems to be uh, smaller than one, so again we would expect that this is a stationary process. And let's again look at the actual time series. And we can see this still has all the hallmarks of stationary process, seems to come back to constant mean as we go, but we see some persistence in here, as uh, indicated by our coefficient of 0.62, clearly larger than zero. So let's lastly uh, estimate this model for Z. So what we get now is a coefficient of 0.94. Uh, point Okay, so let's look at the actual process. So we, we get a value pretty close actually to 1. Uh, I want it open. A line graph. Okay, and you can see our you can see our series our series here. So let me just actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, let's see if I actually can do that here. Oops, let's see if I can copy that over here. No, that didn't work. So let me just write down what our process was, our estimated process was zt hat equals 0 .0 0.811 0.811 .811 plus 0.946 plus 0.946 times z t minus 1. So this is getting fairly close to 1. Let's just have a look at the at the series. our series set. So this is this looks quite persistent now. Here though I would say the jury is out whether that is a um, stationary process or not. Now the difficulty of course is that so is that smaller than one? I'd say here the question mark is out. We cannot use use as a normal t-test 
to test the hypothesis over this guy here. Let's call it let's call this coefficient gamma one. Over gamma one is equal to one or h that gamma one is smaller than one. Unfortunately we cannot use a t test to do this. I discussed this in the lecture. So at this stage we just have to leave at a little bit of hand waving and saying that we are possibly somewhat suspicious about this theory, so whether it's stationary or not. So going back, would you use yt and or set t as an explanatory variable in a regression? Yt, no worries, we concluded this is this is pretty stationary. Set t would possibly say no. Now let's go continue to the last question in the time series section. So, so what we now have is that we have a series, time series, for which we know that we have these three correlations. Okay, or point first order autocorrelation, or point seven eight second order, or point six five third order, or point five two. The question is, what? If, if you were to estimate an AR1 model, you know what sort of value would we would we expect for the AR1 coefficient? So for yt, alpha naught plus alpha one, yt minus one plus ut, what sort of value for that alpha one would we get? Expect if we have a process that has these correlations. Now, as before, we know that in an AR1 process. Okay, that is specific to an AR1 process. Rho 1 should be equal to alpha 1. Rho 2, rho 2 should be equal to alpha 1 squared. And rho 3 to alpha 1 cubed. So now, as we know that rho 1 is 0 0.78, so what about setting alpha? equal to 0.78. Now if that was the case, what would we expect row 2 to be like? Well, we would expect it to be 0.78 squared. And 0.78 squared is 0.6084. And row 3, we would then expect to be 0.783. And that would deliver a value of 0.47455. So if we now compare these values here to the values which we actually have, 0.65 and 0.52, they are not, you know, they are not too too far away. Now we we got these values by setting alpha one exactly equal to the first correlation. But basically what we now need, we need an alpha 1 that fits these three correlations as well as possible. So, you know, you could have tried, let's say, what if alpha 1, let me better use a different color, what if uh, we had set alpha 1 not exactly equal to 0 0.78 but perhaps equal to 0 0.8, what would we have then gotten for row 2, we would have gotten for row 2 0.8 squared, that is 0.64, and for row 3 0.8 cubed, which is, uh, better make sure I don't get that uh, wrong, 0 0.512, 0 0.512. So altogether, this actually seems to be fitting a little bit better. Okay, these values here all together seem to be a little bit closer to here. So, but anyway, we will possibly find an alpha somewhere in this region, 0 0.78, 0 0.8, because the then resulting theoretical correlations do seem to be fitting quite well with the observed correlations. So let me now continue with the uh, 
with the next question, we'll go to the heteroscedasticity question. Actually, question one isn't really a question; it just tells you which data, which data to use. Uh, house price file. So let's load that up first. Let's close down our. Our time series file. Oh, I don't want to save that. Go. Let's see house prices here. So we can see the data here are prices, assessed value, bedrooms, lot size, square feet, house size, and whether it's a colonial style or not. And we have, if we look down, we we'll have 88 observations. So let's go to eViews and we'll open a new work file. Eighty-eight observations. Let's just get all the data in. Series are uh, the first series is the price. Okay, this is uh, just a little bit, a little bit of work. And size bedrooms. living area and the last variable, sixth variable, is colonial. So that's a dummy variable. One if the house is of colonial style and zero otherwise. So now we are being asked to calculate a model with uh, the house price as dependent variable and lot size number of square feet living area and the number of bedrooms as explanatory variables. So here we go. Uh, we have a constant of negative two, uh, two one. If the coefficient rating for lot size is 0.0068 or 0068, you are right. So we are right. Phew. Well done. So here's our regression model. So let's see what the actual question is. So that was two we've done. Okay, we've done two already. So let's see what we are meant what we are meant to do next. Three, perform a wide test for the presence of heteroscedasticity. So remember what the wide test is gonna is gonna do. We have our regression model. We have price as the dependent variable and as um, we have alpha naught plus alpha one times lot size i plus alpha two times square feet for the i of tau plus alpha three times number of bedrooms plus an error term. So we estimate this by all s. We've done that. Estimate by all s. And save the series of estimated residuals. Now where can we see where can we see that in uh, in eViews whenever you run a regression in the resid object what you get is a saved series of the residuals. So we could actually, uh, we can look at this graphically, let's say a line, we'll just 
look at all the 88 residuals, they're just ordered in the, uh, in the order in which we get them. It's cross-sectional data, so the order isn't important. So we could also, for instance, look at some descriptive statistics. Of course, the, the mean of the residuals is zero. It's basically zero, negative 4.3 to negative um, 14. So we have 14 zeros before we get a value here. We get some standard deviation, and you know there seem to be some very large positive outliers. Perhaps there's a bit of skewness. So that's what we see. But the question now is, do we have heteroscedasticity? We see. We know one thing we could do is we could look at these uh, residuals as a function of some of the explanatory variables. So let's see. Let's open resid and square feet together and perhaps we can look at a graph, perhaps at a scatter graph. Um, actually I wanted the other way around. So we have square feet resid, open this group, graph, uh, where's the scatter here? Okay, so you have square feet on the horizontal axis and then the residuals on the vertical and you know is there any indication for heteroscedasticity here I'm not so sure I can't really see any clear pattern here perhaps there would have been a pattern if you hadn't had that one residual here but uh, as it is I can't really see a pattern so that was of course square feet against uh, residuals, what about for instance number variable lot size against residuals, can we see a clear a clear pattern here and about, a, about the same, I can't really see a clear pattern, it's a bit you clearly have one house that's much larger than the rest so that makes it a little bit difficult to see here on the graph but there doesn't seem to be a clear pattern. So that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't no there's no heteroscedasticity because we have a number of variables here and the relationship the variables could be correlated to the error variance in a complicated manner. And to do this we'll do a white test. Okay, so in the white test we estimate a auxiliary regression with the squared residuals and on the right hand side we have a constant and now we have all the um, all the variables so let me I forget the coefficients I'll just write a list of the variables here we'll have lot size but we'll also have lot size squared then we have square feet and we have square feet squared and we have bedrooms and we'll have bedrooms squared and now we can have cross products here potentially so let's see what cross products do we have we have lot size times square feet and we have lot size times bedrooms and we have square feet times bedrooms. Okay, so if we do that, we have one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine explanatory variables. So let's see. Let's go to uh, to eViews. Here's our regression model. So we go to View, Residual Test heteroscedasticity and now here's the white test option let's say include the cross terms and what we get is the following regression result okay we get our nine explanatory variables we have an R squared of 0.383 so let's write that down okay from this regression we get 
an R squared of 0.383 or n is 88, we have 88 observations. So our coefficients here, let me just include one, so that would be beta 1 plus, I have all sorts of co coefficient here, so the last one is going to be beta 9, because we said we have beta 9, we have 9 of these coefficients, and I should include an error term. The hypothesis we are now testing is that all these variables here are insignificant for explaining variation in ui hat squared. So the null hypothesis is going to be that beta 1 all the way to beta 9, all of these guys are 0. The alternative is that any beta i is unequal to 0 for i equals 1 to 9. This is equivalent to homoscedasticity. And if we uh, come to conclude that the alternative hypothesis is valid, that would be heteroscedasticity. So our test statistic is uh, what we call an LM test statistic, n times r squared, so that is going to be 88 times 0.383. We're going to calculate that uh, soon, but this is distributed under the null hypothesis chi squared with 9 degrees of freedom. So that means we will reject h naught if Lm is larger than the critical value um, than the critical value. I'll just briefly rush to my board which book. I shall look up in the chi square table. You of course do that well uh, do that as well while well, I'll do this. So you find the chi square table. Let's say did I prescribe an alpha? I didn't prescribe an alpha, so we need to set one. Let's uh, set alpha equal to 0 0.05 because we were a bit boring. Go to the chi square table, 9 degrees of freedom, 0 0.05. The critical value is 16.5. 9.2. So we reject H0 if Lm is larger than that critical value. So what's the value here? 88, 88 times 0.383. It was? 3.3, exactly. 33.704. So here we have 33.704. And that means we reject H0 and hence heteroscedasticity seems to be present. Heteroscedasticity, that's right. So if we go back to the EBS output, of course we could have seen that immediately because the test statistic is reported here, 33.73. Okay, that's exactly 88 times 0.383. We rounded a little bit before. Now, looking at this regression, we can perhaps also see which variables seem to be responsible for explaining the variation. And if you can look, I look. Let's look at the p-values here. There are a lot of large p-values, meaning they are not really explaining a lot. But there's here, there's a one a little bit marginal. Lot size times square feet, and most clearly this one, the first variable, actually the lot size. So there does seem to be indeed some relationship between lot size and uh, the uh, residual variance, perhaps somewhat interacted also with the square feet. Okay, But it was so complicated that by just looking at the pictures we couldn't actually see it. So that's why we needed that test. Perhaps before we continue with uh, 
of the next question, let me elaborate a little bit on the on the testing here. So this was the white test with uh, with cross terms. And I said that it's just remember what the white test was in comparison to the Proch Pagan test it gave us sort of clear instructions of which variables to use. So if we go back here to the white test, um, just kind of statistic test to so the white test, okay. All the only choice it gives us is do we want cross terms or not? Okay. Incidentally, as I said in lecture, if we say no cross terms, you can see the only variables it includes is the squared, is the squared terms of our explanatory variables. So you can see here we still conclude that there's heteroscedasticity p-value is still fairly small. So that means if you choose the right test, there's sort of a, a a fixed prescription of which variables uh, which variables we use. If we use the Proch Pagan test, and here's an option Proch Pagan Godfrey test, if you click on this, what you see is there's a window opening here which asks you which regressors do you want. What that means is EVS is asking us in our auxiliary, uh, auxiliary regression which, which variables do we want here on the right hand side. And I told you for the Proch Pagan test, you really have to think about which variables you want there. And this is basically what EVUS is doing here. It asks you, tell me which variables do you want. It does, by default, put in all the explanatory variables of our original regression, and that was here lot size, square root, and bedrooms. But it puts this window here to suggest to you, well, there may be additional regressors which you want here and you can put any in from from your data set okay this is what the Proch Pagan test uh, is actually in fact if you click OK and you decide that you just want uh, the levels unsurprisingly it's again the lot size which it seems to be significant and we would reject the null hypothesis as well it turned out in our white test it was exactly that variable which turned out significant as well. So we get basically the same story here. Okay. Now let's go to the fourth part. Estimate the white standard errors for the model in one. So what we need is we need to go back here. Here's our uh, let's first estimate our model again. Here's our original model. If you want white, but importantly, these standard errors here, they come from our from our normal formula. That is the sigma squared times x prime x inverse, and the diagonal values from that matrix will be the standard errors. We know that if there's heteroscedasticity, these values are incorrect. They're not the correct values for the variance of beta hat. And here are all beta hats. So, um, perhaps I can just um, let's see how that works. Actually, nah, doesn't work either. Sorry, I can't. Um, um, it's a remote desktop here, and I can't copy and paste this. So. What we want is go back to estimate and go to options. And here's an option heteroscedasticity, consistent coefficient covariance. If you click here, one of the options is wide. In fact, we'll talk about the new vest a little later. So we'll just click OK here and you get new results. It turns out these coefficients are exactly the same as before. So the coefficient estimates haven't changed, but these standard errors now have changed. Okay, these are now the wide. Uh, the white standard errors. So let me, let me see. So this is basically what we've done. What we've done here. We estimated the white standard errors. Now we could perform uh, t tests. In fact, let's just perform uh, a t test. Let's see. If we want to see whether the number of bedrooms is uh, important. Okay. So that's have well, as our model here. Here's our model. Let's test whether alpha three is uh, we'd expect if at all the more bedrooms more expensive. So we want to see is it really uh, significant. So we are gonna 
test the following hypothesis. Alpha 3 is smaller or equal to 0 and the alternative or the one-sided test here that alpha 3 is larger than 0. Let's say we use an alpha of uh, 0.05 again because we are boring and what we now need is a test stat and uh, we use our t statistic so we need alpha 3 hat minus 0 that's from the null hypothesis divided by the standard error of alpha 3 hat but we're going to use the white standard error. This guy, how is it distributed? Well, it turns out that it is asymptotically normally, standard normally distributed. Now this guy, is that okay? With 88 observations? Uh, I'd say that's possibly a little bit of a marginal case, but we, it's difficult to evaluate. Okay, ideally you would have something clearly larger than 100, but let's say it's okay. So what we want to calculate that, we need the um, estimated value for alpha 3 for the bedrooms variable is 13.853. That is 13.853 divided by the standard error. Have we got 8.479 8.479 in fact we can get the t stat from here as well 1.634 1.634 we can use the EVS t stat because our null here is that the coefficient is equal to zero so now the decision rule we need Decision rule reject H naught if now we have a one sided test statistic, so we reject if the t test is larger than some critical value. Now, the critical value in normal distribution, let's do a little picture normal distribution. We want the value that cuts off 5% in this area, and uh, that is going to be 1.645. 1.645. So if t is larger than the critical value of 1.645, so we have no absolute values here because it's only a one sided test, then we will reject H0. Now the T test is actually just to the left. Okay, it's pretty close, but we have to conclude that we do not reject H0. So it appears that the number of bedrooms is not significant in this case. Now let's look at that model. Why would that possibly be? That doesn't sound reasonable. Number of bedrooms has no effect on the price of a house. Well, it's possibly true that the number of square feet, the size of the house measured in square feet and the number of bedrooms are quite highly correlated. In fact, they will, they will carry more or less the same information. We'll talk a little bit more about this sort of issue when we talk about multicollinearity. But uh, we could, for instance, uh, just look at the correlation between number of bedrooms and square feet. Open this as a group. And let's calculate a correlation here, correlation, and that's not what I didn't want. Uh, cross correlations, that's what we need. And what we find is here yeah, is our value 0.53. We get a fairly large value also gives you correlations with where well, one of the variables is lagged, but we are not interested in that. Oh, point where well, the, the lag is, we are interested in lag is zero, so we are just calculating the correlation between bedrooms and square feet. That is quite large. So, last question for the day. Appear here, and here it is. 
why in general terms would you consider a weighted least squares estimation of the regression model in one? So let's put a name to that regression model. Let's call that model one. Let's actually copy that. Ah, that's not what I wanted. Let's copy that across. What are we going to work? Here we go. So, this regression model we estimated it. So, it turned out that we have heteroscedastic error terms. So, what was the consequence of that? We needed to calculate. needed to calculate wide standard errors if we wanted to perform inference if we wanted to perform inference using alpha hat or estimator of the alphas when using OLS. Okay, when you use the OLS estimates which we use, then we had to um, to use wide standard errors. But we know a second point, but alpha hat OLS is not efficient. Or it's not blue. Okay, and the part which breaks down is that B part, okay? It's not efficient any longer. So, for instance, what does that mean? It means it has unnecessarily high variance, the beta, uh, the, the alpha hat all S. So, for instance, we um, we saw that the um, that let me just run this model again and did we have lot size square foot bedrooms we realized that our model decided that bedrooms wasn't significant as a variable now that may of course be because our variance or the standard errors is unnecessarily is unnecessarily high oh okay uh, we of course want to use the right standard errors here the question is, is there perhaps another estimator which is more precise and perhaps then we can argue that the number of bedrooms is indeed significant. So that means we really we want to, to figure out is there, is there an efficient Sorry, I got interrupted by a phone call. The question is, is there an efficient estimator for alpha? And the answer is, in general, yes. And we call that the GLS estimator. So, and without going into much detail, I, I just want to illustrate, I want to estimate a GLS estimator in eViews. And let's do the, the weighted least squares, okay? Oh, we know for the weighted least squares, we need to find a variable that we think may be proportional to the standard deviation of the error terms. Remember back on the, uh, the Y test, which we performed, where we found out that there was heteroscedasticity and when we actually looked at the right regression, let's do let's do that again. Residual test, heteroscedasticity, wide, including the cross terms, we figured out that it was the lot size which was the variable that clearly determined the variation in the squared residual. So perhaps it's the lot size which, which is proportional, which we can use as proportional to uh, to the variance. So to estimate a weighted least squares regression, you need to go to options. That's where we have already clicked white, and there's another tick, weighted least squares. And 
it will ask us for our weighting variable and we will use the lot size. Okay, so that basically by putting a lot size here from the equivalent in our lecture is that it will put the lot size on the diagonal of the P matrix. Okay, so that's our variable which we put into the P matrix. So we click OK and we get again a new parameter estimate. And now these parameters are now going to be different to the OLS parameters. And just a quick view, remember we said perhaps we can manage to get an estimate for bedrooms that is efficiently enough estimated to find it to be significant. So now we have a T statistic of 1.73. So that T stat is a little bit larger than previously and that is partly because the coefficient is different but relative to the coefficient also the standard error is, is somewhat smaller. So you get 1.73 and uh, we know if we had done a t-test, our critical value would have been 1.645 for a one-sided test. So then we actually would have been able to reject the, um, the null hypothesis. In fact, I realize the story might be even, even more different or more clear, because I remember in the options, if you do weighted least squares, you don't necessarily need the right standard errors anymore. You, you use it if you think that not all of the uh, variance is captured by this lot size, but let's assume that is the case. So we estimate without the right standard errors, and now we see uh, these are exactly the same coefficients as we had before for the uh, for the t for the weighted least squares. We get slightly different standard errors. Now we find a t stat of 2.25. So that's clearly significant now. So these coefficients have been estimated more precisely. Okay, so that basically answers that last question, and that is uh, the uh, that is the um, exercise two.